Great. Thank you very much, Leo. Uh, there was a lot of information about Metasploit. <laughs> I'm continuing my workshops on getting a job. We've talked about writing a CV. Tonight, I'm going to be discussing acing the job interview. It's part of the same process, which is professional branding. Okay, seeing yourself as a professional and making the sale. Remember the employer in this case, the potential employer is the buyer and you are the seller. So I have actually a great story I'm really excited to share that I've just been learning about the past couple of days. So here's the overview, introduction to corporate culture, job interview skills, um, sample cyber job interview questions. I'm not actually gonna go into those, but I'll give you some resources for those. Okay, I've talked before about the work world. It's sort of a cruel world. It's a competitive world. It's a dog eat dog world. But we're in cybersecurity, so it's even nastier. It's tougher. It's more brutal. Um, I'm going to use the word masculine, um, though I'm going to talk about Haredi women who are fighteriot, that they're warriors. So it's both for men and women. Remember, this is part of security, so it's like paramilitary culture. The banks and the companies, everybody's under attack. There's a war going on, and we are being hired to fight as mercenaries in this war. So you're interviewing to become a soldier. So you have to bring some toughness. If you're feeling down or weak or vulnerable, so <laughs> leave that at home. Um, you know, eat your Wheaties or swallow some raw eggs like Rocky Balboa. Do whatever you need to do, pound your chest. But when you go to a job interview in cyber, you want to come in tough. You want to be, you know, a soldier. I'm going to say even a killer, okay, a warrior. And again, I've told you that Baruch Hashem, we made a Baritzva recently, and I have beautiful pictures and videos, and that's what my life is about, but not when I go to a job interview, because work is not about family, Shabbos, or Yontif, or marrying off your kids. That's what it's about for you, maybe. But in terms of your professional persona, Work is about helping the company make money. And that's really important that you communicate that. Yeah. So matzah, you gotta buy the matzah. And matzah is really expensive, as you know. Fine. So when somebody says it's not about the money, then you know it's about the money, okay? <laughs> but here's, that's, that's the stum. But listen, there's all kinds of people you're gonna meet. Some people are really smart and technical, but they're low EQ, right? They have a low emotional intelligence and they're not good with people. And some people are just jerks, okay? And you're gonna meet some jerks along the way. And maybe the person interviewing you is really a jerk, but you know, he's the gateway to this job. So you have to find a way to communicate with him and make the sale. So I have a helpful tip of bosses and nephews care about money. I have a story, I'm gonna skip it right now. But you know, if someone doesn't want to see you and you send them a brief message and you put dollar signs in it, then they'll probably want to see you. Okay, here's my great story, something I've been um, reading about the past couple of days. I'm reading a book called Outliers, The Story of Success by Malcolm Gladwell. It's from 2008, I'm a little bit behind, but that's okay. And so I call this the story of two geniuses. And I have on the screen two geniuses. And one is uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, and actually a movie in 2023 is coming out all about him. And he's sort of the father of the atom bomb, okay? He, he was really the manager of the Manhattan Project during World War II that the United States of America was trying to develop a nuclear bomb, which, okay, it killed a real lot of Japanese people, and that was tragic, but it ended the war, and it saved really millions of lives. So whatever you think about it, He's a Jewish guy from the Upper West Side of Manhattan. His dad already made a lot of money. Their art collection, they had works by Picasso and three original Van Goghs in their house, okay? He went to the School of Ethical Culture. Now he's sort of, these, both these men on the screen, Oppenheimer and this other guy, Chris Langan, they have IQs around 180, 190, you know, way off the charts, okay? Like geniuses, you know, 140 or something like that. So these, these are unusually talented individuals in terms of brain power, but they have very different outcomes. And they're, they're both quirky and sort of crazy. Oppenheimer, study, uh, he suffered from depression and he tried to kill his tutor once in college, 
but he he knew how to handle people and so he he would get what he wanted um and what he wanted was to get this job of managing the manhattan project to create you know this nuclear bomb it's like the most important job ever in the 20th century in 1944 and the guy hiring is a general and he and the general himself went to mit and understands engineering and oppenheimer's not great at at you know um applied engineering he's more theoretical like they said about him he couldn't manage a hamburger stand but he wanted this job and so he talked to the guy i think his name was gloves and and he sold him he he made the sale and he got the job and so oppenheimer he he had a bunch of girlfriends who were communists and he himself was connected to the communist party and the soviets were trying to steal you know the the data of how to make an atomic bomb so he was like in a way a terrible a terrible candidate. He was really smart, but he had connections to communists. He was like unstable mentally. Um, but because he came from like a, a rich Jewish background and had gone was from Manhattan, he had a lot of self confidence, and he could get people to do what he wanted. And so he gets the job. This other guy, Chris Langan, I understand he's still alive. And he's a wacko sort of again, he's, he's like the smartest man in America or smartest man in the world his IQ between 195 and 210, whatever. But he, he's done nothing with his life. He's like a bouncer. He was a bouncer at a bar, and now he's a, a horse rancher. And he hasn't published anything. And he thinks that all the colleges are like, you know, corporations, and they're out to get him. And he's an anti-Semite a little bit. He's, he's, a, he's a pretty big jerk. And he's done sort of really nothing with himself because he got, he got kicked out of college because his mother fought, forgot to send sign the form for financial aid. And then another time his car broke down. And so he asked, could he be transferred to the afternoon class? And they said no. And because he grew up, he was an abused child. His, his mother had four different husbands, whatever, you know, a, a, a wrecked household in Montana. And so he doesn't get on well with people. And so even though he's so super smart, and again, for even in a scientific way, but he couldn't like get jobs or do anything. So we actually had a student who was very smart and like he, he would be a jerk at job interviews. And he said to us, could you just get me a job? And the answer of course is no, we can't just get you a job because you're gonna have to work at the job. And if you're a jerk, they're not gonna wanna work with you. So emotional intelligence, self-confidence, getting along with people are really, really important. And you're gonna demonstrate your people skills at a job interview because you're going to be interacting with the human being we talked about it's not easy to get a job interview your cv has to be good your linkedin and uh, the keywords and all those things but once you get a job interview it's now you and another human being so how are you going to do in that situation so we're going to talk today about like tactics and specifics about that but again developing your professional persona being a team player getting along with other people is a really big deal that will make the difference between success and failure in life. So it's, it's worthwhile to invest in your people skills. Okay, so here's the topics we're gonna go through. Um, preparation for the interview, transportation, listening skills, communicating your message, understanding the guy across the table, the man or woman, your body language, your attire, what you're wearing, your jewelry, um, what not to say, follow up after the interview, and then some specifics for cyber jobs. Okay, as most things in life, how you prepare is going to be the best indicator of your success in your job interview. And I actually had this, there were job interviews where I went, and I really was not properly prepared. And guess what, I didn't get the job. If you haven't done the research on the company, like then you're a jerk. You need to do research and prepare yourself for this meeting. So do your research. What do you know about the employer? Who do you who is going to interview you? And I talked before, is it going to be a human resource person? I generalize and say it's going to be a woman in her 30s, right? A CTO, which is like a guy in his 30s or 40s, or the CEO, which is like a guy or maybe a woman, but in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. And, and so they're coming from different perspectives, those people. And you're going to talk to them in different ways about different topics. And you may not know the answer. I mean, at a second interview or third interview, you're probably moving up and you're going to meet a, a quote unquote more important person. But again, it, it, you should prepare for each one of those meetings and the kind of things you're going to say and tell about yourself and what you've done. 
So um, part of your preparation, what questions do you want to ask? Make a list of those. What questions are they going to ask me? Make a list of those. What you're going to answer? Write them out. Work on them. Record yourself. Watch yourself. They're going to ask you your strengths and your weaknesses. What are you going to say? That you're right. It should not be at the job interview. It's the first time someone asks you, what's your biggest professional weakness? Because they may ask that. And so you should be prepared to answer that in an intelligent way that doesn't kill the game for you. Transportation, right? It sounds obvious, but in real life, you know, people get lost and come late and that's pretty much a deal breaker. If you can't come on time for your job interview, then you probably can't work here. So plan a low stress way to arrive at the interview 15 minutes ahead of time, right? Guess what? There's lots of traffic jams in Israel. So whether you're taking a bus, a train, or you're riding a bike or however you're getting there, you're in America, whatever it is, plan your transportation strategy. Make a practice trip. If it's a place you don't know how to get to, I mean, we have ways. It shouldn't be that hard, but go the day before to make sure you know how to get there. You're nervous. You need to be at your best. You want to be calm and focused. So the stuff before getting there should not drain your energy and nerves. Okay. Let me put this down if I can so I can see my stuff. There we go. Okay. Um, listening. Listening skills are super important. Again, throughout your professional career, it's good to be able to say good things. It's very important to be a good listener. And so I have here a beautiful quote. It's better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. If you don't have something smart to say, just be quiet. And it's okay, a little bit of silence in a job interview. It doesn't have to be blah, blah, blah the whole time. If you, they ask you a question, you have to think about it. You could say, I need to think about that. Or you could just think about that and pause and think before you say something intelligent. So learn about the job and the employer by attentive listening. So you're going to be challenged to say things in the interview, but you should also be going to listen and to learn. So listen and pay attention. Find out what qualities they're looking for in the person they want to hire. Allow the interviewer to guide the conversation in their desired direction and pace. Again, be aware. Show you're a good team player and can listen and interact effectively with others. Some people are so full of themselves that there's no room for anybody else, and that's not a fun person to work with. So if you're so light, you know, self-confidence is good, but if you're totally egocentric and self-absorbed, that's already sort of a red flag. This is already a higher level of understanding the role and the personality of the interviewer to tailor your messaging to that person and what they're, in, what they're into. And again, that was how Oppenheimer got that job. He understood the general who was interviewing him was an engineer and he, he impressed him with his engineering stuff. So you gotta think about that. How am I gonna make the sale of me as a professional to this person to get to the next level? Okay. Communicating your message. So your CV was an expression of your professional brand. Your interview should continue to express that message and branding. It's what you say and it's how you say it. We're, I'm going to talk a little bit about transferable skills and professional values, which are more than just, you know, the cyber skills that you have. Those are things beyond just the technical skills. The basic message, though, of the job interview is the following. I can do this job. I want to do this job and I can get along with others and contribute to your team. That's really what you have to convince the other person. The job interview is not therapy. It's more like acting the part of the effective hire. Again, look into their mind. They're trying to hire someone to help them do their business, make money, solve problems, be more efficient. <clears throat> so they have like a picture or profile of that person. So you should be that person communicate that you understand and you can be that person. That's really what the job interview is for. So there's a certain amount of acting. You're acting the part of the person they want to hire. And that's okay, that's not dishonest because you're gonna act that every day at work. You're gonna be your best professional self to be the best professional that you can be. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, transferable professional skills. So the, these are things that you have that are above and beyond your cyber skills. They could be technical skills, general technical skills, but your communication skills, 
whether it's speaking or it's writing, your critical thinking skills, the fact your multitasking skills. And again, everybody writes on their CV multitasking, but that's not so meaningful. But if you can bring examples, that's more meaningful. Your ability to work with others, your teamwork skills, your creativity. We had a guy in the cyber class who created really great cartoons of, of cyber stuff. And that was a really great skill that he has. Your leadership skills. Not everybody has leadership skills. They are something that can be developed. But if you do have them, so talk about them and, and make the sale based on that. Professional values. And this is important because we come from a community with values, but our values are a little bit different than the mainstream culture. So it's important that you sort of bridge the gap, the cultural gap between where you're coming from and who you're selling to. And again, we've had people in America who are working for AT&T or big Goisha companies, but they know how to leverage their values and their professional values either it's to downplay certain things or to emphasize certain things, but bridging, bridging the culture gap is important. Professional values are things like motivation and energy, commitment, reliability, determination, your pride, your integrity, productivity, economy. You know, you could say I'm the mother of eight kids and my husband, you know, is, uh, is on a, a fellowship, right? He has very limited income. So I'm supporting my family. So I've learned how to manage our family on a very limited budget. So if I'm working for you, you know, and that involves some purchasing or whatever it is, I'm just giving an example of the fact that I'm frugal and able to make ends meet on limited resources shows that I could be really effective in this job for maximizing productivity. Okay, so that's like a bridge between my sort of poor, quote unquote, poor Haredi lifestyle and the fact that I'm working for this company, but I'm going to be really careful with every dime. Systems and procedures, right? I always follow the chain of command. I'm going to work through the system to make change. These are just examples of professional values. You should think about your own professional values and how you're going to um, communicate them and demonstrate them and use them to make this sale. Understanding the person across the table. So use your interpersonal skills to gauge what interests the other party in a conversation. Tailor your messaging and communication to the type of person you're speaking to. Like I said, is it an HR person who's you know more warm and fuzzy and cares about people, the people aspect, the team aspect? Is it a CTO? That means they're a, a cyber person, a computer person. It's more dry and technical. Is it a CEO? That's a business. It's a money thing. Okay, so your messaging will be tailored and tweaked based on who you're talking to. And again, that's not dishonest. That's like good sense. If you're at a Kiddush or a Simcha and you talk to different people, so you talk to people about what they want to talk about. That's how you make friends, right? So you want to be aware of the other person. Body language. Um, some people aren't aware, but your body's always telling a story. Okay. Nonverbal communications are actually the majority of our interpersonal interaction. So your body's telling a story. So make sure it's telling the story that you want it to tell. So again, you got to practice. You got to maybe um, do a Zoom, uh, a practice interview on Zoom. Watch yourself and others. Act like the person you want to be. And I wrote here again, Haredi women can be fighteriot, that the fact that you're a woman or a mother or a young girl, so what? There are, and again, I have experience with this, that we have a woman who was in her 40s or 50s, but she's tough as nails. She's a Haredi woman, you know, like a Hasidish woman, but she is, she needs to make money and she's really tough. And so, you know, there's plenty of young women who are also, they're, they're really tough. It's, it's a mind thing. It's a mind and a personality thing. So, you know, how you sit at the table and everything, everything that you do with your body, as well as with your words, is going to be telling a story and presenting your professional persona. So think about that and use it to your advantage. Um, this is about what you wear and your makeup, your jewelry. And the, the key word here is professionalism. Look like the employee that they want to hire. 
your clothes, your hair, your makeup, your jewelry be telling a story. Make sure it's the story that you want to tell. I have here sort of a, my son just had bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah boys, like Haredi bar mitzvah boys, they're like 90% hat. You know, they have this giant hat on this little little boy. They're mostly hat. And I think also a lot of times the kala. She's like 95% shaitel, and then there's like this little woman under the shaitel. You don't want to be that. You want to be a person. You want to be a professional. You want to make a statement. So your clothes need to be professional, but not draw attention to themselves. You don't want to take attention away from what you've got to say and your persona. You don't want to distract with other stuff. You want to demonstrate by what you're wearing and your, your makeup and your jewelry that you can re represent the company in an honorable way to the clients, to the investors. You don't want to be over or underdressed. And we actually had sort of a funny case of this, of a Hasidic girl, and she was really, she was a smart a young woman. And she wanted to work um, in insurance. And she went to a couple interviews and she wasn't getting the job. And she came to our office and my wife was working with her and, and she was wearing too much makeup and too much jewelry. And she was Tsanua, but she looked like a chachka. And so nobody could take her seriously as a professional. So my wife told her that to her face, you look like a chachka. And so the next job interview, she wore less makeup and less jewelry and was more you know, down to earth and ready to be what she needed to be. And sure enough, she got the job and she's a very successful insurance agent today. So you gotta be dressed for the part. Okay, there are things that you should not say um, at, a, at, at a, particularly at a first job interview. There's a time to discuss vacation perks and salary. It's not at the early stage of the interview and probably not until they offered you a job. Stay focused on relevant topics. Um, use any extraneous topics only to strengthen your case or your connection. And I have a link here. But I want to tell you now a true story. A guy who took our course, smart guy. Um, I think he has Israeli mother, English father. He's in London. And, and it's been hard for our English students to get a job. Um, just a, a brief, a, one sentence, you know, what's the definition of anti-Semitism in England? It's hating Jews any more than is absolutely necessary. It's not easy for a religious Jew in, his, in London to get a job. He, he used the number 200 different job opportunities. He finally got an interview and went and got a second and third interview. And he asked me, when should I talk to them about Shabbos and Yontif? And my answer was really clear, not until they have offered you the job, okay? And so, and we talked about how, what's he gonna do about shaking hands with the women and this and that. So there are things, there are challenges for a religious person um, in this field and in any, any field as a professional, you're gonna be challenged, but you have to learn how to deal with it and overcome these things. And there's a time and a place to discuss those things, which we agreed that it would be when he is making his contract, he needs to protect himself that he won't be able to work on Shabbos or Yontif, even if it's an emergency, if it's not Bikok Nefesh. Um, but until they'd offered him a job, that's not relevant because they, he needs to show that he's a professional they want to hire. Then when they have made that decision, we want to hire, then he's got to say, okay, I also have this. And then they could say, okay, then we don't want to hire you. Or even though you have that, we still want to hire you. But if you say it at the beginning, you're running the risk of killing the deal before it ever got started. So just, you never want to lead with a weak card. You want to play a strong card. So play your strong cards and keep your weaknesses for later until that you feel secure and only when you absolutely must uh, expose them. Good questions, bad answers. Um, somebody had a test, tell me about yourself, but don't say anything that's on your resume. So you should think about that. What are you going to say if they ask you that, right? And you should have stories or something to tell that's interesting, why you love cyber, how you found cyber, whatever, but something that's going to get you forward and single you out as the right candidate that's not written on your CV. And this is just a great list of 10 things just to never say in an interview. I'll do whatever. That means you're desperate and you're sort of apathetic and that's not what anybody's looking for. Asking them, what do you do? That's idiotic, right? You should have researched that already. Oh, my last company, you're groaning. Nobody wants a groaner. I didn't get along with my boss. Then you're probably not gonna get along with this boss. They ask you a question, you say, oh, it's on my resume. I don't care if it's on your resume. I asked you a question, give me the answer. Oh, perfectionism is one of my biggest weaknesses. So that's just like stupid, right? 
I think outside the box. Again, really cliche. How much vacation time do I get? Bad question. Nope, no questions. Bad, bad statement. How soon do you promote employees? Also, not a good question. I had a guy um, a while back and he was going through some personal turbulence, let's say, and he, he thought he was going to use that to get a job, but that's really wrong. You know, look at these two candidates. One guy is begging for mercy. Please give me the job. I really need it. And the other guy is like a warrior, right? So you, you're never going to get a job by asking for mercy. You're going to get a job by showing them that you're a really tough competitor and you're a winner. And if they hire you, you're going to make money for them and do great things for them and lead the way and conquer. Everybody wants to be with a winner. Nobody wants a loser. So even if inside you're hurting and you're mourning and you're crying and every terrible thing in the world, Lo Alenu, has happened to you, leave that at home. And when you come into the job interview, put on your armor and be a warrior. Okay, that is the way to get a job. After the interview, you, you should ask at the end, when can they follow up on the results? And following up is good, a phone call, an email, whatever it is. You need to keep track of your progress. Because remember, getting a job is a job, and you have to be devoted to that and put in the time to make it happen. Okay, um, cyber-specific stuff, and I'm going to try not to keep you over time, so I'm, um, I'm really at the end. Remember, in cyber, and especially if you're coming into your first cyber job, skills are king. The question is, what do you know how to do? Okay, so expect to like put your fingers on the keyboard to do something at the job interview, or at least to tell about the things you know how to do, or that better yet that you've done, like a project that you've done. So talk about that, demonstrate your skills. Certifications are a really, they're like an ace of spades. If you can say, I have this, that, and the other certification, I'm working on this certification. I want to get that certification. That says you're a professional in this field, okay? Anything you don't know, nobody knows everything. They could say something you don't know, Say, oh, I'm interested in that. I want to learn more about that. Where can I learn more about that? And if you've learned anything in this course, it's that Google is your best friend, right? So there are there's a bunch of videos on YouTube about 10 cybersecurity questions in an interview, um, questions and answer. What's the difference between um, cryptography and hashing or, or whatever, uh, encrypting and hashing? Uh, the, the OSI model, they're going to ask you the OSI model. So you should know that really sharply. Be really, really prepared uh, at your job interview to review the basics of networking and of, of cyber, of what you know. So we wish you much success in all your endeavors. We're here with you. Um, again, this guy in England, he came back to me a bunch of times through email, asked me questions. What should I do about this? How should I handle this? And I love that. I loved helping him. And I really did help him. And he really got the job. And he's like now in his third month there, whatever. He just had you on TIFF. Um, so we're here for you. So keep us in the picture. Uh, if you have any questions now, you're welcome to ask. Otherwise, I wish everybody a good night. And I will upload my presentation. Thanks, everybody. Bracha